Look on the page opposite the order of service and let's join in the responsive reading for missions. Lord God, you are a healer to those who need healing and a comforter to those who need comforting. Your name Strengthen your church to go out into the world and serve those who need to be delivered from the hardships of this world. Sustain those who face long illness, bearing them up on the wings of faith and courage. Renew within us the spirit and mission of God. Fill us with the fire that urges us to be your witnesses through service. Come with the power of God. Work through us, your church, your chosen people, to help bring light to this community and to the world. We declare healing and restoration to those who are broken and are in need of a touch from the Lord. We declare their restoration because we will be your feet and hands. Hold us accountable. Be with those who serve you throughout this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, obviously we are focused on missions today, but I want to, to let you know that uh, we're also going to celebrate Christ the King Sunday, which we don't often get to celebrate. As you know, usually we are hanging the green on this Sunday evening after Thanksgiving, but because... Uh, November start started on a Thursday. Well, when November starts on a Thursday, or the second is a Thursday, we get an extra Thursday in there, which allows us to have Christ the King Sunday. So I think it's only appropriate that we celebrate Christ's kingship and we focus on missions as well. Let us stand and sing these two hymns, 304 and 306.
rare Sunday between the celebration of Thanksgiving and the start of Advent, we gather with feelings of blessing and expectation. In the richness of your love, we have found bounty. In the power of your presence, we have found sustaining strength. Now we approach this coming Christmas season confident in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, you are an extraordinary God. You astound and amaze us. You cause us to shout. You bring us to our knees. This morning we are asking nothing less than that you speak your love into our lives and make us new. We know that Jesus would want no less of us, and we pray that we would give no less. For Jesus' sake, and in his name we pray, amen. Good morning, and welcome. When guests spend time with us on Sunday mornings, we are grateful, and there are a number of you. I hope you will let us spend a few moments with you in return before you leave. You're always welcome here. With the next Sunday, we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. By the time you return for worship here next Sunday, this space will have been transformed. During Advent, we have much to look forward to, starting with next Sunday night's hanging of the green and the sweet and savory bar following. One other thing we get very serious about this time of year is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We get seri serious because missions is part of the DNA of this church. We believe we can do no less than share of our bounty with those who are serving Christ on foreign mission fields. More about that as we move through this service, which is devoted to missions. Our meditation in scripture comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that this morning that we would have a sense of your presence, something approaching what Isaiah experienced when he saw you in the temple on a throne high and lifted up. Lord, would you fill this room with your wonderful, glorious presence. Father, would you give us this morning a special sense of your holiness as we come here to worship you. We think about how perfect and majestic you are, and we also consider that we are a sinful people in your presence. Our lives are filled with uncleanliness, with remaining sin, and Lord, were, were it not for Jesus Christ, for his atonement, we would not be able to come into your presence. Lord, we confess our sins to you this morning. Those thoughts that we have that are filled with anger, lust, hatred, animosity, 
Lord, we ask for forgiveness and we ask that you would forgive us for not loving others the way that we should, for not having a heart for those who are lost, for not loving you as we ought. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ, that we can come into your presence this morning and worship you and lift up your name. I ask that this morning you would give us a special sense of missions and our responsibility to give and to pray and to go. Lord, give us broken hearts for those who don't know you, for those who don't know about your holy presence and who do not bow the knee to you and worship. Lord, we pray that the nations would come to know you, that they would trust in Jesus in order that we would magnify your great name and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Well, we are all here because of missions. You, me, uh, answered answered somebody. Uh, called you know someone someone worked on us, and uh, they they were on a mission for Christ to reach you and me, and they did so whoever that may have been. And so I'm singing today a song that could be viewed as response to accepting Christ. <clears throat>
make disciples of all nations. Says Christ to us through Matthew 28. Let us stand and sing this offertory hymn. <laughs>
children's message, so kids, please come on up front, meet me up here. All right, now while you're getting settled in here, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever traveled somewhere pretty far away? Whether it was in the car or on a plane, have you ever gone somewhere pretty far away? The beach. The beach. Okay, you've been to the beach. Where else have you been? To the mall. The mall, yes. <laughs> to Florida. Florida, okay. To Disney World. Disney World, yeah. Florida. Okay. Audrey? Yes, you've been to Florida too. <laughs> now, when you went to these faraway places like Florida, the beach, you were having fun, you were playing on the beach, you traveled far away, you endured that long car ride. Let me ask you another question. Do you know what a missionary is? What is a missionary? What, what is a Christian missionary? Let me put it that way. places to tell people about Jesus. That's right. They go places to tell people about Jesus. And this morning, we have a very special guest with us, and she is going to talk about international missions. She's going to talk about Christian missionaries who go to faraway places to tell people about Jesus. Now, why do, why do we have to tell people about Jesus, do you think? Why do we need to tell people about Jesus? Why is that necessary? Because he loves him. Okay, because he loves them? Because it will make God happy. That's right, it will make God happy. And so you're gonna see over the next month when we get closer to Christmas, you might see envelopes like this. And this is for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so one way, that we help to support missionaries is to give our money so that they can go over and they can be missionaries and live in other places and tell people the gospel. Another way that we can support missionaries is to pray for them. And kids, you might even be thinking, you know what, I'd really like to be an international missionary someday and tell people about Jesus. And that is something that you can do, that we can do also, is that we can go ourselves and be missionaries. But when we think about sending missionaries, we want to make sure that we know what the message is that these missionaries are bringing. What is the gospel? What is the gospel message? What is the gospel? To be brave. Well, Jesus was very brave on our behalf. And you know what he did? He went to the cross and he died on the cross for our sins because we are sinners. And not only did he die on the cross, but he rose again from the grave. And that is the great hope that we have that Jesus brings us into a relationship with God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, thank you for Jesus, that he died for us, that we have hope in him, that we can have a relationship with you. Lord, help to make our church a missions-minded church, that we would want to send people from our own congregation even overseas, that we would have a heart for missions, that we would give, and that we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Frank Chuck Cantrell, Executive Director of the Christian Activity Center in East St. Louis. When talking about solid citizens, the kind of people you like, the kind of people you like to hang out with, often refers to them as good people. As in, you see him, he's good people. Well, I'm here to tell you that when our guest this morning, Sandy Wisdom Martin, is here, we are definitely talking about good people. 
From her growing up years in Southern Illinois, she has risen to one of the key positions in all of Southern Baptist life. In fact, I was mentioning after first service that I, I don't know that there are a lot of a lot of rock stars in Southern Baptist life, but I think she is one. <laughs> I, I cannot say that I'm surprised by her election to the position of executive director of Women's Missionary Union, but I can say I was pleased. She gives missions leadership to churches like ours and demonstrates with her own example and investment something important. You are probably more likely to find Sandy involved in a West African construction project than sitting behind a desk. She is wife to Frank and mother to Hannah. She is a committed follower of Christ and a longtime friend of Lynn Stanley Baptist Church. She talks the talk, she walks the walk, and following our choir anthem this morning, it will be a special privilege to hear her again.
want to thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning. I consider it an honor to be at Win Stanley. This has never been my church home, and yet it has always felt like my church family. Every time my dad was in the hospital, Pastor Steve would visit him. And I can't tell you what that meant to my father. At times, Don would be with Steve, and they would love on, and they would pray for my dad. Eight years ago, my mom went into the hospital and with a blood clot in her lungs, and it, the same thing that had taken our sweet friend Kay Shipley a few weeks earlier, and Dawn met me in the ER. My mom doesn't like to be fussed over. When I went into her ER room, her response was, for crying out loud, who called her? <laughs> it's my mother. My mom is one tough woman who had to learn as a child to take care of herself. We went to mom's ER room and my dad is there and my brother and my sister and me and, and Dawn and the ER nurse comes in and says only two family members are allowed and and uh, now I've been a rule follower my entire life. I always follow rules. Dawn says we'll just be in the waiting room. And uh, I look at my brother and sister and ask who, who is going to stay? And my brother says we're not leaving until they call the cops. <laughs> and my sister is nodding. <laughs> And I, I didn't know that you can do that. I promise you, I was in my 40s before I realized that following rules were optional. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, my brother and sister knew it all along. I had, I had no idea. Steve and Dawn, thank you for loving on my family through the years and for giving me a church home away from other church homes. I often tell people that we used to live in a zoo. We had a 20-pound cat named Ginger, a six-pound dog Chihuahua named Butterbean, and then there was Crystal, a hamster, a varmint as I referred to her. We went to Branson one summer for vacation. The neighbors took care of the pets, and we got a phone call. Crystal had escaped from her cage. And I said, she'll go back to her cage when she's hungry, and I tried to sound calm, but when I hung up the phone, I thought, that thing is going to die in my heating ducts. How long does it take dead hamster smell to get out of the heating ducts? Got a phone call a few days later. One of our neighbors put food in her hand and sit in the office floor for an hour and coaxed Crystal out of the closet. And she scooped her up and put her in the cage. And the whole neighborhood celebrated Patty as the hamster whisperer. <laughs> Before going to Branson, I cleaned the cage, but I forgot to put twisty ties on the door, and Crystal was good. <laughs> she could escape. Patty got her back on the cage and put a twisty tie on the bottom door, but she didn't know there was a door on the top. Got another phone call. Crystal's escaped again. And by then, we were on the way home, and I said, don't worry about it. We're almost home. Do you have any idea what damage a two-ounce hamster could do left in the closet alone for one week? The thing's this big. My dresses were in shreds, and I was about to panic, and then I remembered my beloved blue dress was in another closet. I'm notoriously thrifty. When I lived in Illinois, I had a blue dress that I just loved. And one time I did a retreat in Northern Illinois, and they gave me a gift card to Kohl's, and I gave it back, and I said, your gifts to the cooperative program, pay my salary, pay my travel, I don't need this, but thank you. It showed up at my desk in Springfield, Illinois, with a note that said, get a new dress. We have a tie. <laughs> the dark blue one. I am cheap. I'm a bargain maniac. I love to find deals. I've been married for 25 years, and my husband, when we got married, had a microwave. And uh, the microwave was over 20 years old, but it still worked, so you couldn't possibly get rid of it. The plate had broke out of it. It didn't really heat things up very well, but it ran, so we kept it. But one summer, I found a microwave at a yard sale for $5. Brought it home, plugged it in, and actually got things hot. So we sold our microwave at a yard sale for $5. So the new microwave cost me nothing. That was the greatest deal of the summer. I'm cheap. Something happened with my eyes a few years ago. I went to get a pair of reading glasses when I could no longer read the print. They wanted $14.99 for a pair of reading glasses. And I thought, no way. Then at the bottom of the display, I saw 90% off, $1.49. That's more like it. 
I, I got the glasses, I took them home, I put them on, I looked in the mirror and just started laughing. I turned to my husband and said, Frank, I've turned into my father. <laughs> my husband was not amused. <laughs> but the price was right. When I was a child, it used to bother me that I looked like my father. He had curly hair, I had curly hair that I hated as a child. He had a big nose, I have a big nose. I didn't want to look like my father. Today I don't really mind. One Christmas I took a digital recorder home and I asked my father some questions. My father was a coal miner, he had black lung, but I wanted to record some stories for future generations so the story of my father could live on, so his grandchildren and great-grandchildren could know this man. My father was the last of 11 children. His mother died right after uh, my father was born. His father remarried and along came more children. My father knew nothing but poverty, even as a young adult, with children. They couldn't afford a house, but my mother and father scraped up enough money to pour a basement not too far from here, and that's what I lived in growing up. We didn't even have an indoor bathroom. Now I know that was common during the Depression, during the 40s, during the 50s but not during the 70s. I know my father worked two jobs at one time, so I asked him about it that Christmas. My father worked REA Express. Does anybody remember? It was sort of a forerunner to UPS. It was over by uh, Union Station in St. Louis. He heard it was closing. He had put in 19 years, and uh, he had kids to feed, so he went out and got another job. The first job was an hour and a half away from home. The second job was out past the St. Louis airport. So it was two hours away from home. So my father would go to the first job, work it, then drive to the second job and work it eight hours and then drive home and sleep a couple hours at night. And I said, Dad, how long did you do that? Thinking maybe you could do that for a few weeks, maybe a month, and he said four years. Four years. I had no idea. A few hours of sleep a night for four years? Are you kidding me? Who does that? And yet I seem to recall that my father was in church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, and he never turned down anybody that asked him for help. I want to look like my father. I want to work hard, and I want to care for my family, and I want to serve the church, and I want to be the hands and the feet of Christ. And when people see me, I want them to see my father. I want his story to see on, to live on. And if people see me and see my father, then I know he, they will see my heavenly father. Don't we all want to look like our heavenly father? Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We are to grow and to mature every day as Christ followers so that we look like our Father. How can I look like my Father? Well, I can spend time with Him, I can listen to Him, I can love Him, I can live for Him, and I can serve Him by serving others. I want to spend a few minutes this morning talking to you about Baptists who look like my Father. Soon it will be the week of prayer for international missions, you've already heard that, and time to focus on the Lottie Moon Christmas offer. In 1888, the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering was established to empower the international mission efforts of Southern Baptists. Your giving enables missionaries to share the gospel, as Fielding was talking about with the children. It enables them to make disciples and multiply churches among unreached people groups for the glory of God. When the first offering started in 1888 by Women's Missionary Union, the goal was to raise enough money to send two women to China. In 1888, they raised enough money to send three women to China. Before I left for Thanksgiving, I went to the museum at National WMU. 
because I wanted to look at a letter that Lottie had sent to Annie Armstrong. Now, Lottie Boone was our missionary to China. Annie Armstrong was the first executive director of Women's Missionary Union. Neither were perfect women, but both looked like my father. Lottie Moon said in her letter to Annie, please say to the new missionaries that are coming to a life of hardship and responsibility and constant self-denial. They must live the greater part of their time in Chinese houses in close contact with the people. They will be alone in the interior and will need to be strong and courageous. If the joy of the Lord be their strength, the blessedness of the work will more than compensate for its hardships. Let them come rejoicing to suffer for the sake of that Lord and Master who freely gave his life for them. I brought copies of that transcribed letter if any of you would like to see it and like to have one. I want to tell you two international mission stories this morning. Stories of people that look like my father. Stories that connect both the international work with Women's Missionary Union. My friend Amy lives in Carmi, Illinois. She went with a team from Illinois to serve with Rebecca, your IMB missionary in South Asia. There was an interest in going to work with people, with women who had been rescued from human trafficking. At the Light of Hope Center in South Asia, there is a school and your missionaries work with the girls and they teach them a skill and uh, they use them as a platform to share the gospel. And your IMB missionaries and their national partners go into the slums and work with the poorest of the poor. And they teach them a skill, in this case sewing, and then Women's Missionary Union takes the products that they produce in South Asia and sells them so that these women have a way uh, to provide for their families. Amy says, when we arrived in South Asia, we had a plan and we immediately went to work. We worked with the missionaries and we also worked with national Christians and we were so excited that they allowed us to join in their work and they came with us to join in our work. Although I'm not saying the name of the country, I will tell you it's a Muslim country with also a strong Hindu influence. Christians in that country face persecution daily. At the end of the second day, they were meeting for a time of Bible study and debriefing, and team leaders had said, there's something that we need to discuss with you, and then as a group, we need to make a decision. Before the team arrived, there had been uh, a couple of beheadings of Christians, national Christians in that country. Now information had been discovered that the name of one of the national partners was on a hit list one of the partners that they were to go out in the villages with. Amy said that when that news was shared, you could have heard a pin drop. And then your IMB missionary turned to your team in Illinois and asked this question. Do you want to stay and continue to serve, or should we play it safe and rearrange our schedules? How, how would you answer that question? There have been beheadings. The person that you're supposed to go with is now on a hit list. What would you do? There was complete silence, and the team needed time to think. And their fears already began to set in. And once the silence was broken, one by one, they started sharing Bible verses and what they were feeling and opinions about what they should do. And it was a very intense time. And as they prayed, they shed tears. Amy told me it was the first time out of all my mission trips that I experienced the possibility of death for sharing the gospel. I didn't like the fear, and I was very far outside of my comfort zone. She said suddenly the trip had become very real to me. We left the meeting and went to our rooms to get ready for bed, and she said her and her roommates uh, spent a great time, deal of time in prayer. And... They found themselves crying out to God and asking for direction and wisdom and comfort and protection. She said, we wanted our decision to be all about him, not about ourselves. We knew our brothers and our sisters in this country face this kind of persecution every day. What should we do? The next morning, the team gathered together, and uh, she said, do we truly believe Philippians 12, 1? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. She said, ironically, in the home of a missionary working with women from Light of the Hope Center, that is the Bible verse we had studied together. She said, but suddenly it felt so real. 
when the tables were turned and the question was asked of us. After a time of prayer, Amy said they went to sleep and slept with the best night's sleep they had had in a long time. Just a peace washed over them. The next morning they gathered together and decided that they would go out into the village and continue just as they had planned. As a group, once the decision was made, Amy said, we went forward. We didn't sit around wondering and worrying about what would happen. God gave them peace and they went to work. In one of the villages, in the first village they went to, they met a family whose house was outside the village all by itself. They were happy to see IMB missionaries and your team from Illinois because this family had made a decision to follow Christ. And when that happens in that culture, you are excommunicated from your village. And they had no one to talk to. Amy said it was important for us to go and share the gospel, but it was also important for us to be an encouragement to the Christians that were there. She said if we had played it safe and not gone, who would have encouraged those Christians? By the end of the experience, they saw 33 people come to faith in Christ. 33 people in a place that hardly ever gets to see a harvest. 33 people who would have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ if they would have played it safe. Amy said, it taught me that God is bigger than my fears. She said, I think it also taught me about the importance of obedience. We need to obey God and to trust Him for the details and for the plans. Amy looks just like my father. Your missionary, Rebecca, looks just like my father. And 33 new believers in this village in South Asia look just like my father. That is the power of the gospel at work in transforming lives. And it is propelled by your prayers and by your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Here's the other story I'm going to tell you. Dr. Doug and his wife Cheryl serve as your IMB missionaries in Thailand. Thai Country Trim was one of our first world craft artisan groups. Today they employ 300 women suffering and healing from the scars of abuse. I want to tell you Dr. Doug's Christmas elephant story in his words. He said, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And when any story starts out like that, you know, uh, maybe not so much. He said, we were, we were busy making preparations for the Christmas pageant in our yard, and we wanted to invite people in our tiny village to come to our yard and to hear the story of Christmas. And uh, he said, we invited all our neighbors, and he said, it wasn't unusual to see elephants walking on the road with their owners trolling beside them, carrying bananas and other fruit. And I had a brainwave, and I thought to myself, how cool would it be if we got an elephant to be a part of the Christmas pageant? And he said, it was easy. He said, I was surprised at how easy it was to haggle to get this elephant for a day. It only cost a thousand baht, which is $33. For $33 in Thailand, you can have an elephant for the day. <laughs> the day dawned, brimming with anticipation, and Cheryl, his wife, dressed in her Thai finery, and she went to the second floor of their home and stepped over the balcony onto the back of an elephant. And with 40 church members in tow, they went up and down the streets of this tiny village inviting people to the Christmas pageant in their house. When they got back, Dr. Doug could see that something was wrong with the owner. The owner didn't say anything, but, but Dr. Doug could see that he was upset. And he said, what's the matter? And uh, he informed Dr. Doug, that it was customary that when you rent an elephant, you also are responsible for feeding the elephant for the day. And Dr. Doug had never rented an elephant before, and, and so he didn't know that. So he gave a thousand baht, $33, to uh, a colleague and said, go buy some fruit. And so the guy came back and brought two tubs of fruit for the elephant, and the elephant went, <laughs> and it was gone. And uh, the owner looked at him inspectantly, and he said, elephant hungry. And Dr. Doug reassured him, I want your elephant to be fed. I, I don't want him to be hungry. And uh, the owner and his friend convulsed in laughter, and they said, elephant never full. 
So he sent his friend back to the market to get more food. And this time he returned with two tubs of watermelon and more fruit and the elephant emptied it and the owner looked at Dr. Doug. And in 45 minutes, the elephant had cleaned out $60 worth of food. Dr. Oh. Doug didn't know what to do because they still had another six hours to go before the pageant. <laughs> the owner noticed a row of banana trees and he pointed to them and Dr. Doug said, bananas help yourself. Yes, of course you can have bananas. And the owner said, not the bananas, the trees. And so the elephant walked over to the first tree, wrapped his trunk around it, pulled it out of the ground, and the owner started chopping manhole size pieces of the tree and fed them to the elephant as the elephant gulped them down. At some point, someone came up to Dr. Doug and announced, Dr. Doug, we have a problem. After your wife's escapades out in the village, four or 500 people are coming to watch the pageant tonight. <laughs> and this was a disaster, because Dr. Doug said our yard would only hold about 50 people. And he, he told the man, where are we gonna put 400 people? And the guy said, probably 500 people. And he said, don't worry about it. I have a friend who has a truck, we will go to the soccer field and get bleachers. And so he set off to go to the soccer field to get bleachers to put in the yard. As the elephant continued his deforestation program and was on tree number 14, Dr. Doug heard beep, 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 and a crane above a truck swaying with bleachers swaying was approaching their yard. And as Providence would have it, the truck could nicely fit where the banana trees used to be. <laughs> and so Dr. Doug congratulated themselves that at least that worked out. And they put the bleachers in place, and then the owner said, the elephant is thirsty. And Dr. Doug said, well, we have a hose, and he took him around and showed him where the hose was, and he turned it on, and the elephant started drinking. But becoming frustrated with the, with the flow of the water, he gave it a yank. He wrapped his trunk around it and gave it a sharp yank and the hose tightened and pulled the faucet and then the pump and then the water tank out of the ground. And this didn't help the water come any faster and he gave it another tug. And with a groan, the pipes that went to the side of the house and the spackling and the bricks came loose. Dr. Doug says the evening the people started arriving and the bleachers filled, and then in the yard, there were at least 500 people packed in like sardines. The pageant began, and two other doctors arrived, and they were to join him, riding the elephant, being the wise men on the back of the elephant. But the two other doctors looked at the elephant and made a wise choice not to ride. <laughs> so Dr. Doug got up on second floor balcony, stepped over the rail onto the back of the swaying elephant. And he said, as I approached the crowd, I had serious reservations about the whole setup. The elephant started tiptoeing its way through the crowd, and my heart sank and I started sweating. I had visions of the elephant being startled and, and running amok in the crowd, and he said, I knew what an out of control elephant could do. And I could visualize the headlines tomorrow. <laughs> Baptist elephant tramples tiny Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have been good. He said, I earnestly prayed, oh Lord, please, please watch over everyone here. I'm sorry I ever got this elephant. Don't let anyone get hurt. And somehow the elephant got to where the manger was, where Mary and Joseph were without squashing anyone. And there, Dr. Doug says, an amazing thing happened. He slowly and majestically bowed before the manger. And Dr. Doug said, we had never practiced. And as he slid off and walked forward with his gift of myrrh, he said, I glanced at the elephant sidelong in astonishment. He said, in a country where elephants are revered, Everyone was flabbergasted at the elephant's spontaneous submission while sounds of ohs and ahs escaped from the crowd. He said the audience listened attentively as a Christian gave his testimony. 
And our neighbor, with whom we'd shared many times the gospel, said that he wanted to be a Christ follower, and he accepted everlasting life, and he is still a faithful Christ follower. Dr. Doug says, to God be the glory for his use of his Christmas elephant. Every day as he tenderly treats patients, Dr. Doug looks just like my father. And yes, even riding on the back of an elephant, there is a resemblance. Amy, Rebecca, Cheryl, Doug, they all look like my Heavenly Father. As I said in Sunday school class this morning, Dawn told stories about Bruce and Donna working with the homeless in this neighborhood. They look like my father. She told stories of Dr. Greg and his trip to India. Dr. Greg looks like my father. I hope that you'll participate in mission opportunities in, in this community, in mission trips sponsored by this church, in mission groups, and that you will pray for and give sacrificially to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. But beyond that, I hope that you'll consider your circle of influence. It's not enough to go to church. We need to be the church. Amen. Friends and family members and neighbors are looking for a kind word, a loving touch, a miracle, in their midst. I love what your church bulletin says under the offering meditation. Doing missions, it's not optional. It's who we are as a church. It is in your DNA. Lottie Moon once said, how can I not speak when I have the words of life? This time of year always offers opportunities for reflection. Who do you look like? Today could be, as our scripture said, a time to put off your old self and to put on the new, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Who do you look like? Can people see Christ because they know you? I want to challenge you to look in the mirror with fresh eyes. And if you don't see the reflection of our Father, then it's time to make a change. Amen. Who do we look like? Who do you look like? Has your life been placed on God's hands? Do you know Jesus? Or are you speaking like this we have? Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 367. When you stand with me, let's sing it, let's pray it, let's respond to God.
this morning with us. We have been greatly blessed. And remember, Lot of Moon through this season of Advent. Join me as we pray. Father, you have 